Hey, Margie here, and guess what? This is episode 100 of the Happy Bones, Happy Life podcast. I can't even believe it. And so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to share some of the highlights and some just so that everybody has some real great take-home messages from some of the previous podcasts over these past 100 episodes. So I'm so excited. And I just want to thank everybody who's been on this journey with me regardless of when you started, but I so appreciate all of you. And I'm just so excited. And when I go back and look at all of these podcasts and all this information, it just fills my heart. And the reason is because my mission was to get this information out there. And I really felt that there were so many people, sort of professionals in their own silos, doing great things and helping people with bone health and osteoporosis, but yet their information was not known. So I wanted to provide a forum to get all this helpful information out to people. And that's what it's done. And the greatest thing is that I hear from people how they heard something on the podcast and they changed their life because of it. And there's nothing that makes me happier. There was one man who, who, who I was contacted, contacted me for something and we're talking on the phone. He lived in Oregon and he's telling all these great things he's doing. I said, oh, how did you hear about that? And he said, the podcast. And so that really excited me that people were exposed to things here and they followed up with it and, and lives have changed. And that's always been my purpose with this podcast. So I'm so excited. And what I'm gonna do today is go through some of the previous episodes and just highlight some clips that I thought were really important because there's lots of great information and this should be really fun. So to start with, I'm gonna start with the very first episode that I recorded explaining what was going on with bone health and what the journey I'm on. But also same thing with osteoporosis. You know, so often people will find out they have osteoporosis or osteopenia and what images come to them. The images that come to them are, oh no, I'm going to be all bent over. I'm going to have, I'm hunched over. I'm going to have that hump. I'm not going to be able to be with grandchildren. I'm not going to be able to do all the things I love in life, such as gardening or traveling. No. I, I look at it as a reframe. Look at osteoporosis as an opportunity, an opportunity to just take a look at your life and see maybe what areas are you ignoring or where can you give a little attention? Because when you do, when you address these areas, it's a blessing in disguise. The rest of your life becomes better. You will engage in exercise, be eating healthy, be happier and all reduce stress, whatever it is, whatever area you've ignored, things improve, your bones improve, your overall health, and there's so many benefits. So that's how I like to look at things. And that's what this podcast is about. We're going to have so many interesting people and it's for everyone. Even if you don't have bone health issues, <laughs> there are so many things that to be taken away from this podcast. So I'm just so excited to be here with you. And thank you again for being part of this. And there's gonna be new things that I'm not even aware of. So there'll be things that are new to me in this podcast. And so prepare yourself for this great, great journey that we're all gonna to learn together. The first guest that I want to highlight is Melissa Gallico on episode two. And Melissa told us all about fluoride and how it's truly a bone depleter and it's found in so many things. And it's really interesting because Melissa worked for the FBI and she was, she had acne and she found this out about fluoride because it seemed to be when she wasn't in places that had fluoride, her acne improved. So she, it caused her to go into a deep dive into fluoride. But in the interview, she talks about fluoride in the bones. So listen to this clip where Melissa explains what happens to fluoride once it's in our bones. 
it, it accumulates in bone tissue over time. So the Federation of American Scientists, rec uh, they estimate that the half-life of fluoride is 20 years. So that means that the fluoride that you're consuming today that goes into your bone, it's still, half of it is still there 20 years later. So if you've been drinking fluoride for all of these years and brushing your teeth, with fluoridated toothpaste, and we also consume it through our diet and a lot of sources that we'll, we'll probably touch on a few of those at least. Uh, it sneaks in places you would never imagine. Um, but it, so if you've been consuming a lot of fluoride, it accumulates in your body and not just bone tissue, other tissue as well. But, you know, we'll focus on the bone angle here. And, and that's why I wanted to come on and, and talk about it to, to raise awareness about what foods contain um, fluoride and other ways that we're exposed and what we can do to minimize our exposure to maintain healthy bones over the long term. Melissa continues the interview talking about the negative effects of fluoride and what we can do about it. It can affect our thyroid, our pineal gland, which affects our sleep, which and sleep as we know is so important for every aspect of our health and our bones. And so what can we do about about it, Melissa gives some great tips. First of all, check your water if you need to use a filter. Number two is make sure to buy toothpaste that doesn't have fluoride in it. And number three, fluoride is in the bones as she talks about, but it's in our chicken bones. And so the key here is people with osteoporosis and just in general, a lot of us consume chicken broth because and bone broth because it's so very nutritious. But if indeed we're not using organic chicken, guess what? We're getting fluoride from the bone. So make sure when you are making chicken broth, use organic chicken and chicken bones. Okay, so we're ready to talk about the next interview. And the next interview is episode number three. And this is with Jason and Mir Kaltik. And the two of them have done so much work with osteoporosis because Mira had osteoporosis at a young age. She was helped, but her issue was micronutrient deficiency. She did not have the micronutrients. So in this interview, they really go through the problems with micronutrients and how we need a whole symphony. It's not just calcium, vitamin D, but the two parts that I I mean, everything was great in the interview, but I want to highlight today is when they talk about protein and how important protein is. Because what I see is that people are just not getting enough. And as people get older, they even, they've really found that this is a big factor with muscle sarcopenia, where we're losing muscle, as well as with osteoporosis and bone health. So they do a great job of explaining protein, as well as the omega-3, omega-6 fat and why that's important for our bones as well. So here we go. Protein is one of those things that they always say you can't have too much because you don't want an acidic environment. Okay. Studies have come out that say the exact opposite. So when your body breaks down your bone, your calcium is being leached from your bone, the matrix around the bone, which is made of a protein and collagen, it actually disintegrates. Now you can't just give it calcium and vitamin D and K and expect it to build back up because what that is made up is protein. So the studies were done and they gave people supplementation with those other nutrients and D and, D and, D and calcium. And calcium. I was actually, this one was, just, I think, just D and calcium yeah. in this study. It was D and calcium and no improvement. But they started to look at exactly, wait a minute, there was a group, small group of people in that that actually completely improved within a, like a month period, bone growth, no calcium leaching. And they said, what are these people doing? And they looked at their diet and they were eating a lot more protein. So they found what the magic number is. And this is one we want you all to know about because this is what you have to pay attention to. Stop being afraid of protein. Get it in your head that your body needs the protein. Protein, it's part, amino acids, one fourth of that micronutrient family. You got your amino acids are required by your body, not only to give you muscle to support those bones, but to build the bone itself. And the number is 0 0.545. 0 0.545 times your body weight in pounds. And that's a daily number. So if you weigh 130, 
to multiply it by 0.545, and you get 71 grams. You divide that by four meals a day if you eat four, and you have 18 grams per meal of protein that you're supposed to have a day. That on top of your no, supplement, each meal. each meal, sorry, so it's 71 grams a day, 18 per meal. And when you look at that plus your supplementation, that they have proven is the fastest bone building ratio. It, you absolutely will not build it without it. So stop being afraid of it. Protein is a requirement. And like I said, it's not just your bones that need it to be, be rebuilt, but it's also the muscle that needs to support those bones. As they're getting more frail, your muscle becomes more important. Right. And I'll just say one thing about that too, because a lot of people say, hey, but there's also research studies that show that the more protein you have, the more calcium is secreted through your urine. And what, again, that's been looked at by scientists and they said, yes, you secrete more calcium through your urine, but you're also absorbing a lot more calcium with, because of adding that extra protein. So it balances itself out. Another reason why we don't want to just look at one point of view on things. We really have to stand back with osteoporosis and realize that it's just, it's so many different things kind of happening all at once. And like what Mira said, without that protein in your diet, you are not going to be able to build and maintain your bones and those vital uh, muscles and cartilage that you're going to need to support those. So that's the protein part that really very few people are talking about. The other kind of, I would say, you know, big surprise when it comes to new research with osteoporosis is the omega-3, omega-6 ratio. We've all kind of heard about taking fish oil and getting omega-3 or maybe flaxseed oil and getting enough omega-3, but people don't really focus so much on the ratio of how much omega-6 we take in per day compared to how much omega-3 we take in per day. First, we don't know how much we're taking in. We don't know what ratio we should be doing, and we don't know what ratio we should be trying to reach. So let's start with what What's happening in America with the ratios? Well, can I ask you a question? Can yeah. you, for, so for the people who don't know, not everybody knows the difference, like what's omega-3, what's omega-6. So for our listeners who don't, let's start with the very basics, why, what the difference is. Like what's a, That's important. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so omega-3 and omega-6 are your two essential fatty acids. We hear about EFAs or essential fatty acids. There's only two, omega-3 and omega-6. Talking about, you know, talking in broad strokes, omega-3 is an anti-inflammatory essential fatty acid, and omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory essential fatty acid. Now, people oftentimes think inflammation equals disease, and it does in too high a quantity, but our bodies actually need both. It's like yin and yang. We need inflammation and we need anti-inflammation, but we don't want either one in too much, and that's where that ratio comes in. Our ancestors you brought, had a typical one to one ratio of inflammation and anti-inflammation of omega-6 and omega-3. And that's how our bodies were, are used to, to, to understanding, ingesting, and utilizing omega-3 and omega-6. That's the magic ratio, one to one. Our normal diets today in America are 16 to one, <laughs> to 23 to one, right? That's Lots of, that. <laughs> so 16 to one to 23 to one, that just omega-6 to omega-3, lots more omega-6, lots more inflammation causing omega-6s than the anti-inflammatory omega-3, causing lots and lots of this inflammation. And if, if you also imagine it like, so imagine you have 23 football players running down at this poor one guy who's omega-3. There is no way omega-3 is going to get to fight that inflammation. <laughs> I'm sorry. He is so outnumbered. So we have to keep that in mind. And omega-3 blocks omega-6. Omega-6 can block omega-3 from being absorbed. So when you have this much omega-6, there is no way any of that's getting through. Since my interview with Mira and Jason, they... Their book came out, which is fantastic, Rebuild Your Bones, as well as so many people contacted me because they just love their supplements. They make it easy. They have it in a little drink. So they, they really did a great job. So I've gotten a lot of feedback on that people have enjoyed the supplements that Mir and Jason, that you know, their company created, Cult and Nutrition. Okay, so now we're ready for the next episode that I wanna highlight. And that's with Jessica Drummond. Dr. Jessica Drummond is a physical therapist and she's done so much work with, with females, pelvic health. But what she talks about in our interview 
is the female athlete. And this is not a topic people would think or a population people think are at risk for bone loss, but they are at a young age. And people think they're not because they're athletic, they're putting all these great forces on our bones. But I'll let you listen to Jessica and, and where she explains why this is a population that's at risk. When we think about osteopenia and osteoporosis, we tend to think about women in their 50s, 60s, really older, 70s, 80s. You know, we don't really start thinking about osteoporosis until at least the 50s in most cases. But the truth is, is that athletes and younger people in general are at risk for setting kind of a foundation that places them long-term at risk for osteoporosis because of a lack of nutrient foundation, if you will. So female athletes do exercise a lot. And in certain sports, they have that mechanical pounding on their bones that's actually beneficial for building bone strength and stability in the long term. But with high levels of training and, you know, hey, I have two young daughters and I know how tweens and teens eat right now, right? And on average, they're just not fueling that intense level of activity. Even at the elite level, there are studies done in collegiate athletes and elite athletes. They're not really fueling the nutrient absorption required to maintain that pretty intense level of training. And so the bones are one of the areas of the body that can suffer because they need this long-term building of a foundation of nutrient absorption. So that's one, just absolutely not necessarily taking in the amount of nutrients that they need. So, and, and it's not to say that people aren't getting enough calories. They might be getting enough calories, but not enough nutrient-dense calories that are actually setting the mineral foundation and the amino acid foundation and the fatty acid foundation and all of these um, root nutrients that we need to build bones. And then second... Even when younger women and teens and tweens are eating a healthy, nutrient-dense diet, we have lots and lots of people in this country with digestive challenges, with heartburn and bloating and you know constipation and diarrhea. And if you're having digestive symptoms, which don't always look like GI symptoms, sometimes it could be things like skin breakouts, acne, you know, we can have problems with digestion that don't necessarily show up as digestive symptoms. But if we're seeing digestive symptoms, which in the vast majority of cases we do see, the even though your client might be eating just a great, lovely, delicious diet, they may not be absorbing all of those nutrients because of a lack of optimal function in the digestive system. Jessica has continued to do so much amazing work in the field of women's health. And later on, she also did an episode on endometriosis. So the next guest is Dr. Sherry Betts. And Sherry is one of my all-time favorite physical therapists, and she's done so much work in the field of osteoporosis and safe exercises for osteoporosis. And I absolutely love this interview because she shares so much valuable information and when, what the two clips that I'm going to play are the first one is about yoga, because so many people think yoga is great for the bones. And yes, it can be, but there's also things about yoga that can really be contraindicated, that can really increase your risk of fractures. So Sherry goes through what poses are safe and what poses she really, you know, really should be modified. So that's the first clip. And then the second clip is at the end when Sherry gives her favorite exercises that she thinks everybody should be doing for osteoporosis. So listen in. There's a lot of rounding poses in yoga where at, at, often at the beginning of class, so imagine it's seven o'clock in the morning at the beginning of class and you just bend forward and round your back and hang over. At that time, your discs are full of water and you have more stiffness in your spine. And if you start your day by bending over and rounding your back like that, you're gonna bulge the discs backwards. It may not cause a rupture or you know, a 
bulging disc or herniated disc, but um, you're gonna migrate that disc material backwards. It's like a ball bearing in there. And you're gonna compress the front of the vertebral bodies when the spine is very stiff. It's just like when people have DJD or, or degenerative disc disease of the spine, they're stiffer. And so when they bend forward, there's actually more compression on those vertebral bodies. So you get that, that collapse. And so you could uh, be more at risk for fractures, especially first thing in the morning. And then um, when you're doing your poses and postures and you do something like a rollover, which is like a plow or shoulder stand where you're standing on your shoulders and your thoracic spine is very curved and loaded with the weight of your body coming down on it. The bones are not designed to hold that kind of weight. And especially if, you are osteoporotic, your bones are more at risk for fracture. Those loading or rounding postures would be contraindicated. Now you wouldn't want to do that. I always say, you know, how important is it that you stand on your shoulders? You know, <laughs> there are a, a really compelling reason why you will not be healthy if you don't stand on your shoulders. You know, <laughs> it really stimulates the thyroid. There's, you know, yogic benefits to it and energetic benefits to it. Um, that are from that yoga practice, but um, what are the risks? You know, you can't unring the bell once you've fractured. And how important is it that you do that? It's like no one's going into a nursing home because they can't do the plow or a shoulder stand, <laughs> um, you know? And um, so I think of, you know, the twisting, the deep twisting postures as well. So things like um, doing the seated postures where you're holding on, you're, you're putting your elbow around your thigh and trying to really force the spine to rotate, that actually compresses the spine as well. And any kind of deep rotations, deep twists, or deep movements of the spine. The ones that are not contraindicated that people often are afraid to do um, are cobra and up dog. Well, I just want to remind people of what the most important types of exercises you mm -hmm. should do. Are, um, our favorites um, always include single leg standing balance in your program um, heel raises that the calf is your second heart that pumps the blood back, fluid back to your heart and if you have swelling in your feet or you have you know heart issues like congestive heart failure or COPD things like that that um, swelling in the feet indicates that you're not getting enough circulation so heel raises can actually be helpful for that balance strength and bone density. So there's a lot of benefits. I always tell people single leg heel raises, like that. they're not and fun. A single leg you can do everywhere, right? You can. <laughs> and, anyway. and then I love squats, you know, like the deadlift, the squat activities. Um, I think that's so great for your hips, knees and ankles and great for your um, muscle strength of your legs. And if you can always get up off the floor the rest of your life, that's always a great thing. So squats and then lunges if your knees can handle it. So stand against the door frame if it's too difficult to do lunges, but those are my three favorites. And then um, for back extensor strengthening, um, doing some mobilization over a rounded surface. So we use foam rollers, we use balls. In Pilates, we use the spine corrector, the baby arcs, the ladder barrel. Or I even, um, I'm looking at your sofa back there and it has like an armrest that you might be able to bend backwards over. <laughs> I always look for those in my hotel rooms and, you know, when I'm visiting and I don't have my round surfaces, I will bend backwards over those. I'm addicted to doing spine extension every day, at least once or twice a day. And that will help people. If yeah. people do spine, because I, I see that's probably the most What's really lacking, most people don't think to do spine, you know, they would do elbows, you know, they'll right. think like they're using the weight oh, for their arms, right. And, but they don't do backward, which is the most, I mean, huge. So I think that's right. great. Right. That thoracic extension mobility is great, but it doesn't build your bone density. And then doing something in prone, maybe with a pillow under your rib cage to do back extension and strengthen your back extensors. So those are my favorites, like single leg stance, squats and lunges, and then back extensor stretches followed by back extensor strengthening. Fabulous. That's such, such very helpful tips. Really, yeah. really, really I appreciate exercises that. exercises that you can do in 10 minutes. And make a huge, huge yeah. difference. Your back won't be, you'll be upright, which, and you'll feel better. People are happier in better posture. That, <laughs> there's so many things. I'll cross those collarbones. <laughs> The next episode I want to highlight is Bonnie Rogers. And Bonnie's an herbalist who I met. And she gave such incredible information 
be on teas because tea can really help our bones and there's certain teas that are phenomenal. And so, but Bonnie explains how the important thing is to make a tea infusion. And I'm gonna play the clip where she explains how to do that. And she also gives some great resources, which I'll have under this podcast for everybody about tea and bones and what, what teas we should be drinking. So it was so helpful to me. I immediately bought the little apparatus she showed and I've been using that ever since. It's been great. And so many people have told me they love what Bonnie explained and they've been doing the same. So I found this incredibly helpful, something that's easy for all of us to put into our life and can we can all reap so many benefits from it. So let's hear Bonnie. So it really takes four to eight hours or overnight to open up the cell wall in the herb to release the minerals because you really want you you really want your liquid to have all the minerals in it just like if you're making a bone broth you're not eating the bones but you want the minerals coming from the bones into your broth and you're getting minerals that way so that's another way um when someone's talking about food they may talk about bone broth okay so but what i do is i take a mason jar so for who people who are watching i'm showing you it's just a plain court mason jar and you can just put your herbs in there. You would take one cup of herbs. So whether they're oat straw or nettles, and we'll talk about these. We'll go in into that, yeah. Um, and then I love using this. It's, it's a strainer for making cold coffee. Uh, and I think the, the name is Klein on Amazon. It's like 10 bucks. And I put this right in my jar. I put my herbs right in my jar. And then in the morning, I take them out like this, and I have my tea. And no, then, that's, you know, it's very funny because I make, I make infusions all the time and I'm not as clever as that. You're going to have to spell that. For because us. it's a pain because <laughs> then what you do is you have to take them in cheesecloth and squeeze them out. And this, I just take this, I take a spoon and I kind of push it down to get whatever liquid's left in there. And then and how, do you, how do you spell it? How do you spell that? What is it? What it is? Um, we can put a link. We'll put a link. For I was going to say, is. I'll find yeah. you the link and you can put the link below this podcast so yeah. people can go in and buy it. It's just on Amazon. Um, okay, but that's it's, great. It's a cold coffee strainer and it fits in. I actually, this morning when I did mine, I didn't do a quart. I did a half gallon because if I do a half gallon, then it lasts me two or three days and I keep it in the refrigerator and it's fine. And then what I do is I take my infusion and I heat it up and I put it in a, in a thermos and it sits on my desk and I just drink it so my, my, so my, I mean the drink that I'm drinking right now is my mixture that I make for me which is nettles oat straw red clover and hawthorn berries and we'll talk about why I chose those for myself and I don't yeah. always choose them for other people it's it's what I use for every for, for most people so let's talk a little bit about well, wait, before herbs. we do that, let's just talk about what you said, because this is so important. Okay, so now so I learned something. No, no. So I would, I, my question is, so basically it sits out. Cause I know people always ask that, well, where do you put it once you, so you have the jar, you put so it what in the I, jar. So what I do, I'll explain is I take a cup of the herbs, whether they're just one herb or a combination. And let's and stop I, there. So you buy the herbs, you'll buy the herbs in the form, I, not, not in tea bag form. You'll just buy the herbs in. Right. The herbs come in a bag. I usually buy them a pound at a time. Me too. And you can buy them. I mean, you can go on Amazon. I always tell people if you're going to buy herbs to use for an infusion, buy organic. You don't want to have the pesticides going into your body because you want, you want the best quality that you can get. So you can buy them on Frontier. You can buy them on Star West. You can buy them at, at Mountain Rose. Um, there's a local place here in New York called Jeans Greens. I love, that's where I buy mine, Jeans Greens. Love right. Jeans And Greens. she's wonderful. Holly is a friend of mine. She owns the store and she's really knowledgeable. Um, and so you can buy them in different, at different places. You know, some are gonna cost a little more, a little less. It's not gonna make that much of a difference. I mean. I, I mean, as an herbalist, I have piles and piles of things because I have a whole <laughs> apothecary. Um, but, you know, think about it. It's 16 ounces and you're basically using one ounce is about one cup. So each 
bag that might cost you 10 or 20 dollars is going to be good for 16 days so you might use two bags a month it's not going to cost that much and what's the cost of, of your health to get these minerals in you and so and then so if you buy if you go into a store and you buy a nettles tea bag and you just dunk it you're just getting flavored water so you really want to use this as medicine it's herbal medicine it's not just herbal tea so if you're taking if you're taking i recommend two to four cups a day so i usually will finish this entire thing next up is dr felice gersh and dr gersh is board certified in both OBGYN and integrative medicine and she brings an amazing perspective to the field of osteoporosis and bone health and so in this, I'm gonna actually get to show you two clips. The first clip was an interview we did in the very beginning, actually. And she talks about inflammation and estrogen and how this affects our bones. And so we'll play that. And then the second clip that you'll hear is a more recent clip. I had her back and she, where she talked about testing and she discusses the DEXA and why it's not the end all be all. Yes, it gives us some information, but it's not as accurate as we think. And so that was, and so listen in to this. Osteoporosis is actually a condition of inflammation of the bone. When you have inflammation, you upregulate the immune system to go into action. And then you're going to actually create more activity of the osteoclast. Why do people get more inflammation in their bone as they age, like through the menopause years? It's because of deficiency of estrogen. Estrogen modulates inflammation. So when you have less estrogen in your body in the menopause years, you're going to have more inflammation everywhere everywhere, you name it, and you know, a lot of attention is paid to the vascular system, like in your arteries. You get inflammation in the artery wall, and that can actually lead to atherosclerosis and ruptured plaque and heart attacks and strokes, right? But in the bone, you also get inflammation. <clears throat> and the inflammation in the bone leads to activation of these osteoclasts, which then go a little bit crazy because they're trying to clear up inflammation, and they put out more digesting type enzymes, eat up the tissue. So think about what can you do as a human female to lower your total body load of inflammation? Well, one thing is to have adequate estrogen. Well, the reality is that no matter what we do with hormone replacement in menopause, we're not going to recreate the ovaries of a 25-year-old. So we're never going to have the same actual environment because it's not just having estrogen. It's also having progesterone and more testosterone and the beautiful interrelationships and the rhythm of the hormones. So we're not going to recreate, no matter, we're trying, but we're not going to recreate the environment of hormones that you would have if you're a healthy, functioning 25-year-old. So we have to use these other ways. So one of the ways I mentioned is by eating a lot of plants with polyphenols and antioxidants and plant-based protein. So that's all really critical. Another really important thing is to live with your circadian rhythm. So it turns out that bone, like every single structure in our body, is circadian. So what we want to do is make sure we sleep at the right time. The bone density is foundational. So I think every woman should get a bone density test done when she's early in, like within the first five years of her menopause. And then depending on it, it's not a test that you have to repeat on a really frequent basis. I think that's really important. And the other thing that's really interesting is that they always recommend that you do the test at the same site on the same machine. Now that already tells you something about the test, right? They say, well, make sure you get it at the same site on the same machine. That's because it's not that reliable. I mean, you have to know that it's not incredibly reliable when you jump from one machine to another, it's not that standardized. So that you can, and this has happened where someone will go and then the test is worse or better, but if we're talking about by less than say 5%, and you know, a change and they get all riled up and the doctor says, oh my gosh, your bones are getting worse. We better do something. And it's like, it's not even statistically valid. Okay. First of all, even on the same machine, 
that kind of change, when you're only talking about like a 5% change, and by the way, on the DEXA scan report, they're going, you don't have to figure this out. You don't have to do math. You know, it will tell you what percentage change there was from the previous one. So you don't, that'll say, you know, it's a change of, you know, it's down by 5%, 6%, 8%, or it's up by this or that. But recognize that the quality of the test determines the significance that you should put with the change. And it turns out that anything less than a 5% change in any direction is probably not statistically meaningful. So don't think that that is, oh, my phone's got 4% worse. Well, that's meaningless. Okay, so next, next story. So, but, and if you move from one machine to another, then we're not even sure what that means. So it's, it's just, you know. Dr. Felice Gersh is just full of amazing information. I always love talking with her. And since the last podcast episode, several people have actually worked with Dr. Gersh virtually and thanked me so much for introducing for introducing them to her so that's very exciting she has just great information on her instagram and i'm just a big fan okay so next up is dr stephanie senef and dr senef is a senior research scientist at mit's computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory and she's really quite amazing. She's authored over 30 peer reviewed journal papers over the past several years on glyphosate. And that was her topic. And this is something that's so prevalent. It's the active ingredient in Roundup. It's something that's so prevalent, but yet not something that all of us realize can be, have such negative effects on our bones and overall health. And so, in this interview, she really delves into glyphosate, but what I want to play is what it is. So I want to go back to the basics, how she describes glyphosate. So let's hear what she has to say. I think we're just going to delve right in because we have so much information to cover, but let's start really, really simple. And just because a lot of people, they may have heard the word glyphosate, but they really don't know what we're dealing with. So why don't we start with the basics and just what is glyphosate and why is this such a concern for our health? Glyphosate is the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup, which I imagine most people are familiar with. As soon as you can go down and get some Roundup and use it to kill the dandelions in your yard, it's considered to be completely non-toxic, practically completely non-toxic to humans. And therefore, it's a fantastic herbicide. It kills all plants except for those that have been engineered to resist it. And so it's been a great boon in, in, in uh, growing crops because they can create these crops through genetic engineering, GMO technology, to create these crops that are resistant. And they could just spray glyphosate all over the crop and it doesn't die. So very, very efficient farming comes out of that where you can just control the weeds by just spraying the crop with poison. The poison gets taken up by the crop and gets into the food supply. So we basically have glyphosate all over our food supply. The government doesn't care because it's completely safe to humans. So as long as you believe it's safe, well, then fine. It's great. You know, um, there's no problem. But the problem is that it's not safe. And I am uh, very confident at this point in saying that glyphosate is the primary reason for an epidemic that we're seeing in a long list of neurological, autoimmune, metabolic, oncological diseases. They're all being uh, increased in, in prevalence as a consequence of chronic exposure to glyphosate in our food. I feel very confident in saying that. You know, so back in, the, I guess it was the late 1990s when they did the GMOs. Do you want to just yes. say what they exactly, like how did they do this and what crops did, does this yes. affect? Yeah, so, they, so the idea was, well, they found out that there was this critical enzyme called EPSP synthase, which is in a biological pathway called the shikimate pathway, which is present in most plants and also in many microbes, but which does not exist in human cells. And so the, the, they were you know, delighted by that because they figured it can't affect our cells if we don't have that pathway. We don't have that enzyme. We don't have that pathway. We're good, right? That's the argument. Now, a flaw in the argument is that our gut microbes not only have that pathway, but they use it to produce essential uh, amino acids for us, the aromatic amino acids, which are which we can't make because we don't have that pathway. So we depend upon both our food sources and our gut microbes to supply those critical nutrients. So when that pathway gets killed in our gut, um, we become deficient. And that has enormous consequences because those aromatic amino acids, for example, are precursors to the neurotransmitters, you know, um, melatonin, serotonin, 
uh, melanin, the skin tanning agent, thyroid hormone, various B vitamins, all of these things come out of the um, shikimate pathway. So when, that, when the bi microbes are, are destroyed in their ability to produce those aromatic amino acids, we become deficient in all of these absolutely essential nutrients. Uh, and that causes all kinds of diseases. So that's a starting point. And there's, there's much more, but that's a good place to start. Wow. Well, a couple things. I mean, that's unbelievable. Our melatonin, our sleep, our serotonin, our sleep. That's and right. we know that sleep affects every possible organ in our bones. The yes. And so the, I, you asked me to mention the foods. And so the ones that yeah. have been GMO engineered are, are soy, a corn, um, sh sugar beets, canola. So you've got the oil, the, the, sh the sugar, the corn, and the soy that all of those basic foods go into the processed food industry. So all these processed foods come out of those uh, crops. There's massive, you know, we just produce huge amounts of these crops just to, to fuel the processed food industry, which means that the processed foods tend to have high levels of glyphosate. Now, the other thing I didn't say is that glyphosate has also been discovered to be very useful uh, as a desiccant at the end of the crop's life. So right before harvest, they're spraying glyphosate on several other kind crops in order to kill the crop. So they intend to kill the crop. They want to make it go to seed. It increases the yield, it synchronizes the yield so that you can harvest the seed all at once across the field because everything goes to seed as soon as it gets poisoned by this glyphosate. The glyphosate goes up into the seed and so you end up with high levels of glyphosate. The highest levels that have been found in foods have been found in the ones that are not GMO. So when you see non-GMO, you think you're safe. That's not true. In Dr. Senna's interview, she really goes into how the hell of glyphosate can be affecting the collagen which can significantly affect our bones, as well as reducing manganese, which is also essential. So it's really a phenomenal, phenomenal interview filled with just so much important information. And she continues to do research. And I, I think the important takeaway from this interview is that we want to reduce our exposure as much as we can. Yes, it's, it is everywhere, so we're all going to get some but there's so much that we can do. And the biggest thing she said, the absolute biggest thing was to eat organic. That was the number one thing, as well as she talks about, you know, with, with the wheat, that the, the wheat is sprayed as well. So, you know, staying away, the big thing again, best thing everybody can do is stay away from Roundup, certainly don't buy the Roundup, but, but you know, by buying organic, you can significantly reduce your exposure. Okay, so the next interview that I want to highlight is Kristen Bowen. And Kristen has a company that created a transdermal magnesium. And her company is Living the Good Life Naturally. And what was so interesting was that I had heard about Kristen and I thought the topic of transdermal magnesium was really important for this community because we all, because magnesium is absolutely essential for our bones, but many people have digestive issues and they can absorb the magnesium. And so a lot of people don't realize they can get magnesium through the skin. So that's why I had Kristen on. And why don't we listen to what she has to say about that transdermal magnesium. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, talking magnesium and soaking and building bones and, and waking up in the morning, just having enough energy to follow through on all the ideas and dreams that you have. And it used to be that they said 6.3 to 7 was optimal magnesium levels. And numerous years ago, they dropped it because nobody was meeting the standard. Wow. I don't want to drop my standard for my body just because nobody else around me is as healthy as we could be. I want to wake up with optimal health. I want to wake up and love on those grandbabies and climb trees with them and walk down the beach with them and build sandcastles all day with them. That's what motivates me. And I think it's crucial that we know what motivates us to create health. And so even though they say that five is the standard now, that's not the standard for me. I still want that 6.3 and seven because when there's magnesium around all of those red blood cells, we know that pancreas works better. 
we know that bones go from brittle to resonant and holding those nutrients and literally resonating health. We know hormones kick into gear when you've got enough magnesium. Magnesium jumpstarts so many processes in your body. And that's why we need to, when we go from oral to soaking in magnesium, we get benefits from oral, but we're not getting the full benefits that we could be. Because to take the magnesium to get to cell saturation, orally, you would have massive digestion issues. No one can take that much magnesium without digestion issues. And so that's why I love soaking in it because we can bypass digestion. We soak in that magnesium. Our body uptakes it, utilizes it. Blood sugars get better, become more balanced. Your ability not to react to situations but to have that moment to make that conscious choice and take that breath and choose the better way in your thoughts and how you react to people. And so getting to cell saturation is my goal with magnesium, not just little parts of the magnesium. I want the whole picture for my body. So interesting because you can, so someone can have their blood work and the doctor's like, fine, and they don't even check low, but yet yeah. they're not really at cell saturation. So I think that's a fascinating point. And there are some ways though, to know if you're deficient in magnesium. I mean, there oh. are some telltale signs. So why don't you tell everyone, because I, I see magnesium deficiency a lot. I mean, it's very, very common. So, and that's where the individuality really kicks in. For my mom, who's 84, she's a beautiful 84 vibrant woman that loves to travel and live life and text all of her great grandkids. And it shows up for her as leg cramps. And she knows when those leg cramps start, start to kick in, she'll say, honey, every single time that kicks in, I haven't soaked for a couple weeks. Wow. And I get back in the soak. Now, I don't get leg cramps. For me, it's my energy in the morning. I, and I love waking up and being ready to start my day. I have not always been able to do that. Arthritis held me back from that. Autoimmune, my whole health crash, I just, I do not take that for granted. So for me, if I'm not waking up with energy, literally bounding and ready to start my day, I know that my magnesium is starting to get lower. For my husband, it's tightness in his shoulders. That's his indicator. And so that's the other thing I love about watching women really understand and learn that communication with their body as they understand their magnesium burn rate. They start picking up on nuances and signs that they maybe didn't notice before. And anytime we have a stronger mind-body connection, I think health improves everywhere. I thought it was so interesting about the magnesium and about the red blood cells. And since the interview, I, and at the time of the interview, I was actually doing Kristen's 30 day challenge. But since then, I loved the transdermal magnesium and I loved, I loved two things actually. I loved the soaks. I really, so I felt energized. I really, I really liked it. But the other thing she has is a magnesium cream. And I started using that and it's just fabulous. Any aches and pains, it seems to really help. As well as my husband once in a while doesn't drink enough water and he can be, become dehydrated and get cramps at night. And you put this cream on and instantly they go away. So big fan of that. But very interesting is that people contacted me, numerous people contacted me, thanked me because they've really seen improvements from this transdermal magnesium that Kristen talked about. So it was a very powerful interview that really improved people's lives, which as you know, makes me very happy. Okay, so next up is physical therapist, Sarah Meeks. And Sarah Meeks has done so much in the field of physical therapy and osteoporosis. She is the person that has taught courses all over really trying to educate people on why alignment matters, why you can't just do any old exercise. And her exercises are phenomenal and she's just terrific. 
And so, and I'm really excited that she had joined me on the podcast. But what, what, what I, what the clip I'm going to play is when she talks about, it's called the perched posture and it's a sitting posture that we can all do. And the way she describes it's great. And it's something that everybody could put into use immediately. And posture is so important for our alignment, for our bones. So let's hear what Sarah has to say. Most of the chairs and tables that we sit in or sit at are too low for most people. So it's a good idea to sit a little higher. It's called the perch posture because the more you open up your hips, in less, most people will say, well, you should have a 90 degree angle at your hips. Well, if you have 125, that shows you have less compression on your spine. So what I encourage people to do, I teach them the perch posture, which is to sit on the edge of the chair or on the corner of the chair because then they're sitting on their pelvis. And then I say, now, feel your feet on the floor. You want the feet, right? Yeah, and, I want what you tell people because it's so good. It's then, so good. And then you make sure you, you uh, have your feet on the floor, flat on the floor, and then you bring your weight back on your heels. I'm doing it now and then run your weight up the outer border of your feet and then across the ball of the foot, the metatarsal hands. You should be able to wiggle your toes. You don't have to wiggle your toes, but you should be able to. No weight on your toes. That's called the foot triangle of support. And then imagine that the floor underneath your feet has turned into a slab of wet concrete, okay? Take a breath in, as you breathe out, Press your feet into the wet concrete as if you're making a mold that looks just like those bones of your feet. And then feel the lengthening in your body that happens. Pressing down lifts you up. The third, uh, Newton's third law states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite. So when you press down, you trigger, mu trigger muscles that lift you up. Improve the alignment in your upper body. That's I love perfect. that. So I think everybody, once you do that, just put that into your life because it's so helpful and it's so easy, Sarah. It's such a great tip that really- I'm doing it now. I'm standing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm standing. You can do it standing. St standing online in the supermarket, right? It's and they perfect. Get, they just hired a new cashier and she's really slow and you're thinking, oh my God, I'll never get out of here, you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I'll just stand there and I press my feet in, I can feel my body and then I focus on my breath and before long, I'm out of there. Sarah continues to educate physical therapists, exercise instructors on the importance of alignment and her exercises are phenomenal and as well as the whole Meeks method she created. And so what she did offer on the podcast was if anyone sends her an email, she'll send them the latest version of her realignment routine that's part of the Meeks method. So I'll have her email in the show notes. Okay, next up is Dr. Tabitha Barber. And Dr. Tabitha is a functional gynecologist. So she's a gynecologist who practices functional medicine. And we had such a great interview really on her perspective and how, what, what different things she does. But the clip I'm gonna play is cortisol, that's the body's stress hormone, has such a negative effect on our bones. It really reduces the activity of the osteoblast, the bone building cells. And so she, we talked about how she measures cortisol. So I'm gonna play that clip for you. I particularly like doing it through the Dutch company, mm -hmm. which stands for Dried Urine Testing for Comprehensive Hormones. They do a saliva test where you can do it four times or five times if you want to see your awakening response. And they will chart it on a graph to see what your cortisol pattern is throughout the day. And then they can also check your cortisol metabolites in your urine, which solidifies the validity of the test. So I really appreciate how they lay it out with the cortisol pattern because I can, it's good to have a visual representation of what women are feeling. So if they look at this pattern and they see that their cortisol is way off, you know, the charts where it shouldn't be, it's kind of, it clicks to them. Oh, this, this stress really isn't normal. I am having an abnormal response to it. Or if they're flatlined, it validates 
the fact that they don't want to get out of bed in the morning they can't function at all during the day i'm like it's not all in your head like literally here you are you're flatlined so i just like the visual of that and i think it's really helpful to get patients moving in the right direction they're like okay what do i got to do to fix this and then you retest it in six or 12 months and you can get back into a normal pattern. And that is really satisfying and I think motivating. There was one phrase that Dr. Barber talked about that I just think is fabulous, that we wanna have a voice and a choice. And I, I think that's important. We shouldn't settle. Don't let anybody tell you what you have to do. You do have a voice and a choice. So I love that phrase. Next up is one of my favorite people, is my brother, Dr. Mark Pochabin. And Doc, I, I just call him Mark. He's, he's a GI and he's actually chief of gastroenterology at NYU. And he's done so much. But what I wanted him on the podcast talking about is hope. Because so often you will see a doctor and they pretty much take away your hope. And he explains why that should never be, and we should never lose hope. And I think that's so important for all of us, whatever journey we're on, to always have hope because we don't know. And I believe in miracles and, and I see them every single day. So listen to my very, very special brother. Not all physicians understand that not on purpose, but sometimes not meaning to actually create a problem, they actually create a problem when they take hope away from patients. So let's start, first of all, why? Like, why have you found that hope is, so, is such a vital ingredient and that really is needed for everyone that you as a physician deal with? Well, I think that hope is probably the most important factor that gets people through a difficult time period. I mean, hope has been the main driving force among all great things that have been achieved, not only just in terms of what we've done in medicine, but in all aspects. I mean, think about people coming to this country, hoping for a better life, hoping for a better future for their kids. It's always about what can be, and by hoping for a better future, they're able to sustain a difficult present. And that is so true in medicine, that if we take away hope, we take away any reason to live, to move forward, to get through a difficult time, to get through a difficult treatment. And it doesn't have to be false hope. I'm not talking about false hope. There's plenty to hope for in modern medicine. We just have to make sure we give it in the appropriate form and the appropriate dose. And so often I hear people come into me and I'll see them and they say, you know, the, the doctor just said there's no hope. And and you can see their face is drained, they are so unhappy, but why do you think that, why do you think inadvertently medical professionals, me medical professionals take away people's hope sometimes? Because I think sometimes this concept of being honest, being truthful, giving the patients all the information, somehow takes on this construct that in medicine we look at statistics and we look at outcomes. But a patient is not a statistic. They're either all or none. They either respond or they don't. But when you give them a statistic, especially when the statistics are very difficult, it feels very much from the medical professional's world, like by being honest, you have to tell them that, well, statistically, it doesn't look like this is going to work. And once you put that into someone's mind that it's not going to work, it's not. If you tell someone that they're going to have six months to live, it's like doing a term paper. They, you know, when you are told that you have six months to do a term paper, it's going to take you six months to do it. If you really put in someone's mind that they have six months to live, I honestly believe their whole body sets its frame to that time period. And you don't know. The truth is that we never know how long someone has to live. And I've seen people with terrible diagnoses of pancreatic cancer. You know, that's one of the areas that I am actually first to give a diagnosis in. And I have seen patients being told they have two months to live, six months to live, and they've lived two years or three years. You just don't know. Of course, sometimes they do live only two or three months, but because we don't know, why do we assume the worst? Why not instead assume the best and then try and modify what we're hoping for as we go forward? I think you can see why I love my brother so much. And the next guest that I wanna highlight, I also love, and that's my husband, Dr. Craig Bissinger. 
And Craig is an OBGYN who really suffered his own autoimmune, autoimmune condition that was devastating. And the truth is, had we not, you know, when he was told, I'm so sorry, there's just nothing that can be done after we spent thousands of dollars, saw practitioners from all over who were really, you know, really wonderful experts in their fields. Anyway, it ended up being an autoimmune condition and part of the issue was gluten. And so we go through this in the interview, very powerful. But I want to play what Craig says at the end, because so many times people are scared to deviate from their doctor. And it's just, it's just really, really important to listen to. And so many people, so many people commented afterwards about how this really helped them. I just wanted to give everyone, I, I wrote down a few points, just the things I think are really important for you. The first is, you, know, it's, you live once, it's your life. And you cannot accept it when the doctors say, I don't know, or you're a medical mystery. That's number one. Um, and if it's not in a medical text, it doesn't mean you're not sick. Those are really important. You're not insulting your doctor if you seek other opinions, be it either with traditional physicians or functional medicine or holistic providers. Um, sometimes you need to be the one who pushes things forward and when you dig deeper. And the last thing is just because you went to see another doctor or practitioner to seek out an answer that you weren't getting, it does not mean your doctor is mad at you or angry and doesn't want to see you again. Oftentimes I'm like things, thank you, because I didn't know. And it's a time for me to learn as well. So you have to be empowered to take care of yourself and your health. And if it's your loved ones or others, sometimes they can't see it, you can. So I really encourage you to be proactive in your health and seek out answers. Thank you. And I really, really do appreciate you coming on and sharing because it's not, we don't really like to relive it because no. it wasn't a very pleasant time. But, you know, as I said, lessons have been learned. And I think between the two of us, we've helped so many people really, you know, who who have autoimmune issues due to gluten. I love Craig's words. So if anyone tells you, I'm sorry, there's nothing that can be done, just know that you should keep digging because I really do believe the answers are out there. And that's one of my missions on the podcast is to really try to expose people to experts and, and different philosophies and just new things that are constantly emerging in the field of bone health as well as in the, in just in general, in the field of functional medicine. And so that's been my goal. Before each podcast, I always ask the universe, please let this reach the people that it's meant to reach. And so a few things, all the resources that we talked about from the guests in today's, that I highlighted today, will be in today's show notes, but you can always go back to previous episodes and find all of the references for, for everybody. So it is, that's one of the nice things about the podcast. It lives on. So you can always revisit things and, and take advantage of them. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that this is a journey with all of us that we're going on together. I've learned so much and grown so really grown over these past a hundred episodes. And I, we're going to continue. So if there are questions you have or experts you want or just areas you'd like address, please, you can either respond, you know, in, in the, how you listen to the podcast, there's always ways to contact me, or you can send me an email. My email is margie at margiebissinger.com. And I'll have that in the show notes as well. Or if you have ideas, or if you're someone that you'd like to present, you have some great information, or you have a story, you have a story that you think would benefit the listeners, please, let's share that with everybody. So I'm very excited to continue. Um, next episode is also, I'm going to review some more of my podcast episodes because there's just, there was too much to put into this episode and there's just so many other people and ideas I wanted to highlight. But as I always say that thanks for coming and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.